punchline here is that profits be right, dog. These dudes be getting it right. They nailed it. Bruce Lawn. The real reason why so-called scholars of the New Testament dated late. This may shock you, but once I found this out, if this is the reason that they all line up on this, I can't think of another word than just gross. When were the Gospels written? Most scholars say that the Gospel of Mark dates between 66 through 70 AD, Matthew and Luke around 85 to 90, and John 90 to 100. Skeptics like Bart Ehrman imply that they're too late to be reliable, as a decades-long time gap leaves plenty of room for myths and legends to creep in. When it comes to history... Stop it. So if you guys don't know who Bart Ehrman is, Bart Ehrman is probably a common agnostic scholar. Mm -hmm. A New Testament textual critic, meaning he, he, he is critical of the different variants. He's debated James White. He's debated Jimmy uh, Aikman, which maybe we'll look at that later. This is the dates. This is like the traditional dates, right? 70, 80, 70 80, 85, 95, 80. Those are the traditional dates. Now, the, the logical conclusion is that this is too much time from when Jesus lived to when these were written for them to not have a bunch of myths and legends inserted, right? That's that's yeah. the logical conclusion. Which is pretty which, crazy. Which is well, which is reasonable. Like if, if you write a if, if Jesus ascends to heaven in 30, 30, 30, 33 AD, yeah, and then the Gospel of John, uh, primarily about his divinity, isn't written until ninety five AD, you would go, oh yeah, like that's a pretty big gap, seventy year gap, seventy year gap. Yeah, and the earliest one they're saying is seventy, which would be a forty year gap, right? That's a, that. You go, yeah, man, that's kind of that's that's just a hard pill to swallow when you go to someone and you go, hey, the Bible is reliable. And they go, but Bart Ehrman said that the earliest gospel was written 40 years after the life of Jesus. Okay. But, but that's but, like not trusting Greg Laurie to recount the Jesus Revolution story. Yeah. I mean, well, seven was that seven years ago? No, yeah. it's a 40 year difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but wait until you find out why. Chronological closeness matters. But where exactly are critics coming up with these later dates? When you dive into the literature, you find that many biblical scholars date Matthew, Mark, and Luke past 70 AD for one main reason. Jesus' prophecies regarding the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. The so-called scholarly theory is that Jesus never said these things. They were put into his mouth to make him out to be an amazing prophet. Yes, I'm seeing... Thog. Come on. You're just cheating. You're just cheating. You just can't admit it. You just can't admit this that, is a sickness. that we got one right. <laughs> the highest order. So the reason why, according to Testify and according to Inspiring Philosophy, the reason why they date them later is because Jesus got a prophecy so accurate that they're just like, oh, there's no way he said this before it happened. And so they're just a confirmation bias. 100%. Because I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, and he got a prophecy seemingly right, that means the prophecy was never there, and they wrote it afterwards. Boom, that's how they wrote that. That's crazy! Serious. Almost the entire late dating scheme is primarily based on the question-begging, anti-supernaturalistic premise that Jesus could have never prophesied the coming devastation of Jerusalem in such detail. Prophecy is on par with leprechauns and unicorns. But there's a growing chorus of scholars who challenge these assumptions, and they're not all hardcore Christians. Even some atheist scholars like Maurice Casey or James Crossley have challenged late dating. Well, why is that? For starters, if you know anything about Israel's history, Jerusalem's downfall had happened before in 586 BC. Let's take a look at 2 Kings 25, 8-10. It reads, On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, commander of the imperial guard and official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem. It's these kind of details, the burning of the temple and the seizures of the walls, that some say can only be described after 70 AD, but they happened before. God's prophets mm -hmm. were often the announcers of the curse of the law for disobeying God's commandments. Jeremiah said Jerusalem would be destroyed because of their sin, and Jesus followed suit. As New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd has pointed out, the punchline here is that prophets be right, dog. <laughs> <laughs> These dudes be getting it right. They nailed it. But because you start with the presupposition that prophecy is not real and there's nothing supernatural happening Crazy. here, then that presupposition leads you to believe that Jesus, the life of Jesus was written later because there's no way he could have got this prophecy right. <laughs> Go ahead. As far as any historical event has colored the... It's like, no wonder you study the Bible so well and, and still don't believe in Jesus. Absolutely. It's because like, you just won't, you won't give them anything. You won't There's, give them anything. <laughs> it's give, like, give it's, them the, the destruction of the temple. You know, I mean, I get it if you're like, I don't know about the whole resurrection thing. But I don't like, know if he's walked on water. Give them the destruction <laughs> of the temple, guys. Go ahead. 
picture, it is not Titus' capture of Jerusalem in 70 AD, but Nebuchadnezzar's capture in 586 BC. There is no single trait of the forecast which cannot be documented directly out of the Old Testament. Second, Luke points out that a little-known prophet named Agabus prophesied the famine coming during the days of Emperor Claudius. This was fulfilled in the 40s. But Jesus, the earth-shattering main figure of his gospel, foretells the destruction of Jerusalem and all we get is crickets? This seems a bit odd to say the least. Why doesn't... Sheesh. Luke say Jesus' words were fulfilled in the days of Emperor Titus. I have a theory, and hear me out on this one, maybe because the fulfillment hadn't happened yet. Finally, mm -hmm. Jesus' words regarding the temple's destruction doesn't make a lot of sense unless they happen before the event. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus says that when people see the abomination of desolation, they should flee to the mountains. Mark and Matthew say that Jesus commanded them to pray that it doesn't happen in winter. Matthew right. includes pray that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Luke right. says when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter in it. Here's the thing. We know from history that Titus destroyed the temple in late summer. Why pray mm -hmm. that something doesn't happen at a particular time if it already happened? And what's the right. point of Luke adding a warning about <laughs> not entering into the city if the city was already ruined? The late dating scenario is built on a flimsy foundation. It's no wonder that E.P. Sanders, not a particularly conservative scholar, has concluded that there is no material in Mark which must be dated after 70 AD. But let so that's one scholar that says that. Okay, Let's take things a step further. What if we could determine Luke was written before 62 AD? Enter Adolf van Harnack. Harnack was a liberal scholar who denied the possibility of miracles, and yet he mm. changed his mind about the dating of the Gospels based on some very important evidence found in the book of Acts, Paul's death mm -hmm. or the absence thereof. Let's think about this for just a minute. Eight of the final chapters of Acts follow closely the progress of Paul's trial, and then the narrative abruptly ends before it even happens. Luke gives us great detail of Jesus' trial and crucifixion in his gospel, but seemingly drops the ball in Acts after carefully paralleling Paul's sufferings with Christ. The story just breaks off with Paul left preaching in Rome while still— That makes no, no literary sense. If you're writing books about legends and myths, yeah. and then the way Acts just ends, there's no— real resolution. It just kind of ends. That Paul was martyred in around 62 AD. And nowhere in Acts is Paul treated as if his death was presupposed. Rather, we get a very contrary impression. Harnack notes that this doesn't make a lick of sense. To leave us mm -hmm. hanging about Paul's fate would be bad craftsmanship and not at all in line with Luke's normally thorough character if there was more to tell. Harnack writes, the concluding verses of the Acts of the Apostles, taken in conjunction with the absence of any reference in the book to the result of the trial of St. Paul and to his martyrdom, make it in the highest degree probable that the work was written at a time when Paul's trial in Rome had not yet come to an end. Harnack goes on to argue that it's very weird that Luke, a detailed historian who notes the famine in Jerusalem and the expulsion of the Jews from Rome under Claudius has nothing to say about the Jewish rebellion, the temple's destruction, or Nero's persecution of the Christians in Rome. And he mentions nothing about the death of James, Jesus' brother, even though he's featured as a prominent member in the Jerusalem church in Acts. And there's nothing said about Peter's execution, even though it's mentioned in John's later gospel. Peter is the main character of the first 12 chapters of Acts. Luke does, however, note the death of Stephen, who wasn't even a member of the 12, and he mentions the martyrdom of James, the son of Zebedee. And one last thing, why would Luke sit on his work for a couple of decades rather than immediately send it to the so what he's getting at is that there are other martyred examples documented mm -hmm. in Luke writing up Acts, and there's other significant things that are documented, but for whatever reason, when it comes to the death of Paul, the death of Peter, yep. he wouldn't write about it, and then assume that he wouldn't send it to Theophilus, who was funding this entire thing, right? Go ahead. Mm. What's the holdup? On the contrary, if there was no sign of scheduling Paul's hearing, it may have been Luke's ambition to get his work to Theophilus while still in Rome, waiting for Paul's right. trial, which prompts the sudden ending of his book. There's nothing implausible about Luke stopping his account once he got to the present day. Similarly, why did the first century historian Josephus bring his story to an end when he got up to the present day? Because there was nothing left to say. If Luke used Mark and possibly Matthew as a source, that means they were written before Luke. And with everything Oop. I mentioned here, Axel- Oops. It was written before 16. That means that, that, that means that those Gospels were floating around if Luke used it as a source. That's good. UAD. And Acts, of course, comes after Luke's Gospel. So we're not talking about the Gospels being written 40 to 60 years after the fact. We're talking about a decade or two while Peter, James, and John, and other eyewitnesses to Jesus were still alive and kicking. This clearly is not too late for them to be considered unreliable. There's only one bad reason to reject the early dating of the Gospels, and there are several good reasons to believe that they were written early. That's crazy. Trying to take us out. That's crazy. Um, I need some secular scholars to tap in and say. So, how really many of the that. gospels now were written before seventy A.D.? Oh, I think all of them. Maybe, well, all excuse them. me, except the Gospel of John, which was written towards the okay. end, you know, of his life. I think all of them. Some people even say the Gospel of John is actually talking about the temple destruction. Okay, so 
three of them, which one would be the earliest? Go, let's go back to that list. So he had the very beginning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Mark would actually be closer to what? I think all of them are before 70 AD. No, yeah, but but so then what what do people what do the early I want to say some of them are as early as 50. So within a decade and a half. For example, suggested dates for the writing of the Gospel of Matthew range as early as 40 AD to as late as 140. Okay, that's really early. That's within 10 years. <laughs> okay, there's also a Gospel of Q that's believed to be floating around, but there's no manuscripts of it around. Matthew as early as 40 to 45, as late as 55. Yeah, that's pretty early. So, so this one has a pretty nice and tight yeah. date right there. Yeah, even if the Gospels were not written until 30 years after Christ's death, that would still place them, that would still place the writing of them prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD, in, in 70 AD. This presents no major problems with their authenticity or accuracy, passing on oral traditions and teachings was commonplace in Jewish culture. So this is saying, like, even if they were written late, it doesn't really change anything. It doesn't. Well, that's what I was saying. I was like... Do we not trust Greg Laurie to come on the podcast and, and tell you the truth? Yeah. We're like, oh, Greg, you're old. Yeah. Greg, I, you, so can't, you can't recount your own life. 70 years was 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I see that's a good way of looking at it. Okay, so let's see what this is. The Gospel of Q gets its title from the German. Okay. And the whole idea of Q gospel is based on the concept of the synoptic gospels. They're so similar that they must have copied from each other and or other another source. This other source has been given the name Q. The predominant argument for the existence of Gospel of Q is this. Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written after 70 AD and therefore could not have been written by the Apostle Matthew, John, Mark, Luke. Since the authors of the Gospels were not firsthand witnesses, they must. this is the secular idea behind it. When considering the possibility of a Q Gospel, it's important to remember that no evidence whatsoever has ever been found for the existence of a Q Gospel, not even a single manuscript fragment of Q has ever been found. None of the early church fathers mentioned anything that could have been the Q gospel. Second, there is strong evidence that the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John were written between 50 and 65 AD, not after. Many of the early church fathers attributed the gospel of Matthew, John, Mark, and the doctor. Third, the... Okay, so they're saying the, ch the church fathers really believed that these things were written at the time. Mm -hmm. The gospel was written by Mark, Luke, and John, actual eyewitnesses and companions of Jesus, right? Mark, uh, they say Peter was instrumental in writing the gospel of Mark. Um, John, but the beloved disciple John, and then Luke. Luke was written by someone who traveled with Paul and knew Peter, and Matthew was written by the uh, Apostle Matthew of the Gospels. Record actual words spoken by Jesus. We should expect eyewitnesses to report Jesus saying. Finally, there's nothing wrong with the idea of the Gospel writers using the other Gospels as sources. Luke states in Luke chapter 1 that he used sources. It is possible that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source. It is possible that there was another source in addition to Mark. The possible use of Q source is not the reason why the Q gospel concept should be rejected. The use of a source which contains the sayings of Jesus does not take away from the inspiration of Scripture. The reason the Q gospel should be rejected is the presupposition of most Q gospel advocates, namely that the gospels are not divinely inspired. Also, they've never found it. Yes. So it's not just that they're namely not divinely inspired. It's the fact that they've ne it doesn't it doesn't exist. Right. Right. It's a leprechaun and a unicorn right now. Right, right. And again, it's another <laughs> like, because we don't think these things are trustworthy, we have to presuppose that they all got, and they all use the same source. Or yeah. perhaps they used each other as a source, perhaps they, right? So mm. that's the part that's a little, little fun. According to the Bible, that prayer is extremely important in terms of us being transformed from the inside out when we get aligned with God's will. For the Christians watching this channel, I want you guys to implement these spiritual disciplines in your day-to-day -day life. And the only way I've been able to do this consistently is through writing down my prayers in a prayer journal that does a few things. One, it allows me to reflect and come to God humbly and ask him to move on my behalf. And two, it allows me to document my prayers, which ultimately helped me remember the very things that I was praying for and see the hand of God tangibly in my life when he answers them. So I would urge you, consider writing down your prayers. It could be in a blank notebook. It could even be on your phone. Or you could check out the one I personally designed and used for my own quiet time and spiritual discipline that I think will be a huge blessing. It's the exact structure and system that I've used for years to pray and be more consistent in my spiritual disciplines. You can pick yours up today by clicking the link in the pinned comment below. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.